Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Welsh. I am the field CTO for Generative AI here at Click. Um, I joined via an acquisition of a company called Kindy, where I was the founder and CEO. Um, Kindy had been building Generative AI products for, for several years, and we've been deploying these products for the last several years. Um, and we are announcing Click, Click Answers, um, which is a retrieval augmented generation product um, here, at, here at Click Connect. So just to remind everyone where we are in, in the stack, um, so we covered a lot of things about enterprise um, AI-ready data this morning. We are now going to the analytic part of, of, of the stack, um, where we have our um, analytic product, obviously, uh, AutoML, and now our generative AI capabilities through Click Answers. And so having built generative AI capabilities for the last several years, I have a few things that I love to, to cover, and this is really the, the truth about generative AI in the enterprise. And so one of the reasons why we've been talking a lot about data this morning is because a large language model as a standalone piece of technology is not an enterprise grade gen AI solution. And we'll get into why in a, in a second. What is an enterprise grade gen AI solution is a large language model plus contextual enterprise data. And so let's, let's look at an, at an example. So the problem with large language models, and I'm sure you all are familiar with this, is that they hallucinate and that they're stale. And so an example would be, if we were to ask ChatGPT, what is the gross margin of Apple for the last quarter? In April of 2023, ChatGPT would come back with a direct answer and say that Apple's revenue was 95 billion, um, its cost of goods was 25 billion, resulting in a gross margin of 63 billion last quarter. This answer is absolutely incorrect. It's not even close. We could call that a margin of error. <laughs> Imagine getting this, this uh, answer as a user, and you have no way to confirm, because it's not pointing back to any underlying information. You just take it and you use it. It's com completely unacceptable that you have software in an enterprise that generates anywhere from, at, at this time, there's probably 10 to 20% of the answers were just completely made up. And so, luckily, we fixed it in February of 2024 by just saying, we can't answer those questions. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. Uh, and so um, it, these, these are the big challenges with, with large language models. And so let's cover like why they're actually, these, these answers are, are, are incorrect. So um, in April of 2023, chat GPT's knowledge cut off in September of 2021. So, the knowledge, the information was stale. It couldn't have actually known what last quarter's information was or gross margin. And so what it tried to do is it tried to answer the user's question and it made up the numbers. So it just completely made it up. Um, and I don't know if anyone's picked out the math problem in the answer, but uh, 95 billion minus 25 billion does not equal 63 billion. <laughs> so it was mathematically incorrect. Um, the way to get around this um, is actually by feeding enterprise data or feeding data, contextual data, into the large language model, something called in-context learning or retrieval augmented generation. And so let's actually look at what this uh, looks like manually. And so if you were to ask ChatGPT, what is the gross margin of Apple for the last quarter? And you said, oh, by the way, here are the last four quarters of financials. Say you went to Yahoo Finance or wherever and you got their income statements and you added that information as part of your prompt into the language model. It turns out that ChatGPT is able to get the question absolutely correct. And it's because you're breaking this problem down into two steps. So you're doing the retrieval step where you're asking the question, what is the gross margin? The system is going, I need certain information to actually answer this question. Let me go get the update, up to date information. Let me, once I retrieve that information, I feed that into a large language model with a prompt to ultimately answer the user's question. And so when we talk about retrieval augmented generation, it's that two-step process of retrieval and then generating that, that information. And so I bring this up because this morning we've spoken a lot about data and you'll continue to hear about data. Um, and I like to say that large language models, they need effective data to deliver value to, to an enterprise. And so as a standalone technology, again, a large language model is not an enterprise grade gen AI solution. It really requires that contextual enterprise data. And being, an outsider coming into Click in the last few months, um, the one thing that I saw as being a machine learning company as I joined Click is I looked at Click and I said, hey, 
Click's a data company. And so you've heard this morning all about moving data, you know, uh, having the governance over that data. Um, from the analytic business, we've, for the last several decades, have been um, bringing the right data to business users to answer complex business questions. And so if we actually substitute in um, Click for contextual enterprise data, I like to say that Click plus large language models equals uh, enterprise grade Gen AI solutions. Which then leads to what is the current use case for Gen AI in the enterprise? Well, what we're seeing is the biggest adoptions coming from this retrieval augmented generation. The ability of users to ask natural language questions and get direct, contextually relevant, and trustworthy answers in response to those questions. Feels like every user has experienced ChatGPT in some way and now wants a ChatGPT-like experience in the enterprise. And that's because traditional search is broken. It wasn't broken until people experienced this new experience. Um, I remember so doing kind of semantic search a few years ago, you would go into enterprises and you would say, um, oh, we can help your users get direct answers to their questions. And enterprises would say, I have a search engine. And you would say, there's a complete difference between a search result and an answer. And now that everyone has had the experience of using ChatGPT, they understand that. And so what we're seeing is every search bar in every enterprise in the world, we believe, is going to have a RAG or answer engine behind it at some point in the next three to five years. So we're seeing this massive switch from search results, which deliver you a list of results that you as a user need to click through, read, maybe control F your way to the relevant portion of the text to find the answer, to just being able to ask these natural language questions and get these personalized, direct, contextually relevant and trustworthy answers in response to those questions. Now, one of the challenges with building retrieval augmented generation systems is it actually requires a lot of expertise and a lot of know-how in actually putting this stuff together. And so um, what we're seeing is a lot of folks maybe experiment with some open source tools to start to build data pipelines, come up with some chunk chunking strategy, which is critically important in the pipeline, but I think people un underestimate. They push those chunks of text into an embedding model um, that they maybe got from Hugging Face, AI APIs. They put that in a vector database that they license from someone, or maybe they're putting them into Elastic or Postgres. They use some orchestration. They license a large language model. Then they do some LLL, LLM ops. They do some validation. They do the UI, and they manage that whole system over time. Like, that's kind of ridiculous <laughs> when, you, when you think about it. That's the equivalent of like building the tokenizer, the index, the database, the UI, like yourself if you wanted a search engine. So if you want an answer engine, why can't you just go buy a, a search engine? Well, lucky enough here at Click, we've built that capability. And so um, this is Click Answers. It's a plug and play generative AI powered knowledge assistant. Um, helps users get those direct, contextually re relevant, and trustworthy answers in response to the, their questions from unstructured text data. Um, this provides the knowledge at the fingertips of knowledge workers globally. Um, again, being able to ask those questions and get those answers. We've found that people have spent, or people typically spend about um, 20% uh, of their time looking for information or looking for answers in unstructured text data. If you actually calculate that, that's about one day a week. <laughs> that's nuts to think that people spend about one day a week just looking for the relevant information. Um, and then building this system again yourself is very, very difficult. And so being able to put together a plug and play solution um, then allows the experts, folks like us at, at Click, um, to provide things like explainability to the user's questions. So the ability to um, actually link back to the underlying source documents and see where the system's actually generating these, these answers from. So if you do get an answer to a question and you want to validate whether or not it's true, you can go back to that underlying source document. All in this single plug and play system that is just ingesting unstructured text data and ultimately getting answers out of it. And how is that um, referenced and how is it linked and accessible to the person? Is it is it within your user interface? Is it? Yeah. Yes, so, so, so both. So what we're seeing is actually um, a lot of the use cases where people will, will use Click Answers is actually in a different user interface. Yeah. So as, as, as an example, 
customer support, right? Yeah, and that's what I was kind of getting at. So like if I look at something as customer support and I want to know where it's where it's being coming from, yeah. how do I connect that? Yeah, so, so, so we have APIs that, so we have embeddable technology to embed that in, in the application. We have APIs that we can we can use to actually um, help developers build these and add these to their, to their applications. And so, yeah. And so you'll be able to, you know, plug these into existing applications because I think, you know, one of the big use cases for this is customer experience, customer support agents, and they're not going to go over to a click analytic dashboard to get the answer to their question because they've never been there before. Which then kind of points to like, who, who are we actually targeting with a product like this? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the pieces um, that folks are, are selling out there, whether it's a vector database or the LLM itself, are targeted at develop, developers to cobble these pieces together. We found consistently that there's an AI project leader, leader who has a team that's trying to cobble this stuff together that would love just an off-the-shelf solution. So if I have a business leader coming to me saying, I need a, I'm just going to make up, a, make up an example, an answer engine on our website to drive um, signups for meetings with sales reps and, and demos of our product. Um, why should that AI project leader have to co uh, cobble together all the pieces again isn't there an off-the-shelf solution that we can plug in for that business user in a very quick way? Um, so we'll see those AI project leaders that are ultimately um, um, purchasing systems like this, but then also line of business as, as well. And so again, um, I think one of the interesting things about large language models is it's no longer an AI engineering problem because the model has been built. You can do it, use it to do a bunch of things. Um, it's a data engineering problem and actually pipelining all of that stuff up to get the answers out. So what that means is you can actually go to a line of business person and say, I have a search engine for you. I have an answer engine for you, similar to how you're selling that, that, that search engine, such that they can plug that into the application and ultimately get the benefits of, of that answer engine. When, when you talk about this buyer persona of a knowledge manager, I would have to imagine that whatever that knowledge manager's collection of whether they're systems of record or engagement or both, are those vendors not supplying them with similar solutions today? Yeah, so, so, so they're starting to. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think what's, what's unique is then cutting across multiple sources of, of, of documents, right? And so like you'll absolutely see the point solutions come out with their own retrieval augmented generation system. All right, so um, I'm going to play back what I think I heard yeah. earlier. So what you just told me is that because of your trust score, which includes diversity, which means different data sets, you're not solely reliant on the corpus of information that might reside only in the knowledge management system. Correct. Okay. But, but, but uh, I just want to, so, so yes, the trust score is a, a, a part of the data. Similar is pulling from different data sources as opposed to, like, I may have my HR data that wants to sync up with some IT data for whatever reason, <laughs> right? Those independent vendors are probably not going to provide that capabil capability. So how do you have a system of intelligence that kind of sits on top of that to provide that, that, that value? I kind of think about it just historically as um, those vendors could also provide analytic capabilities, but why would they not provide analytic cap capabilities? Well, you want to look across a bunch of different data sources for your analytic capabilities. And candidly, you probably want an expert in delivering analytic capabilities in, in, in doing that. And so when I think about Click, is I, I think about just a, a history of enabling users to answer complex business questions from their data, re regardless of where that data is. Um, and the same thing applies now on the unstructured data. This might be a weird question, but um, is there, a, if some, so let's say the AI team has gone down the path and has tried to, you know, build it themselves yeah. and they're like, oh my gosh, there's this, this thing we can plug and play. Are they able to reuse some of the work they've already done? Are they able to, you know, I don't know if they can. Yes, yeah, so, so, so they're not going to um, be able to say, uh, we've built the pipeline, we've done the chunking, we've done the vectorization, we have it in a vector store. Can we use our vector store to, to, to plug in? Um, I don't think so yet. Um, that's not how we would do this. This is an end-to-end -end system. Now. What I've found, having built these systems for the last several years, is we're pretty good, darn good at it. <laughs> and so when we go in and we engage with folks, it's pretty rare that we we find a team that has the quality of of end to end and system. Um, so they're happy to say, "Whoo, let's do." Yeah, that. they're they're happy to because because I, I think I think what people 
um, don't understand about artificial intelligence sometimes is that there's a very specific expertise, right? Like as a person that's been building NLP solutions for 10 years, if you put me in a room with someone that does computer vision, we're just talking past each other. <laughs> like the whole, they just, whereas people that don't understand AI go, oh, you, you two are AI guys, just get in a room and talk to, talk to each other. <laughs> you know, and the same thing with, with now data scientists where teams, people have built teams of data scientists and they go, oh, you're good at building or, or writing Python for this structured numerical data to do prediction. Go do NLP. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah, and you need to, if you're going to, just yeah. come on up here if you're going to, yeah. Yeah, so what, what I was just going to add, you good? Okay. What I was just going to add is the same on the predictive side. A lot of the work is data collection, curation, all that, bringing that knowledge together. So if the team's already kind of put together, they've done the hard work of finding the documents, curating a central location to get all those together, then yeah. we can plug in that into our system and automate the rest of it. I mean, Ryan and I just talked to a big, one of the largest financial service companies in the world the other day, and they're, they're, do, they're trying to do it internally. And we mentioned what we have coming out this week, and they go, absolutely, we're interested in that because it is a hard problem to solve, even for one of the biggest companies in the world. So, so you're, you're literally allowing them uh, or giving them uh, permission to let go of their Franken pipeline or whatever you guys call it. Internally. Exactly right. Okay. Exactly right. And so so you're, you're buying their technical debt, and you believe that you're better suited for these kinds of enrichment exercises, then they could certainly try to attract, hire, and retain that talent. But you're delivering it in a product experience right now. Correct. Okay, got it. Yeah. When you say inherit their, their technical debt, I mean, we're not fixing it. <laughs> You're buying their technical debt, is my opinion. Well, if they just have unstructured text data, we're just hooking up to that, that data ingesting that. What, what code are we inheriting from? From the, you're 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 buying it. You're letting them take it away. You're you're taking it off their. Oh yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not cleaning up anyone's code here. <laughs> <laughs> He's making very sure. I just, I just wanted to make sure. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. You yeah. were generating a SQL earlier. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally, totally. I I, I, see, I see what you're saying. So so yes, you're, you're um, candidly the 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 type of folks that are really experts in this that some companies may want to hire and, and have in house. I think should be deployed on like very high strategic use cases within the enterprise. And while these systems deliver tremendous value, there's probably things that those AI engineers say within a company should be adding to their product line oh, yeah. versus, versus um, helping run their business operationally. And so we're coming in and saying, hey, we're the experts in this, in this space. We can help you run your business incredibly efficiently by using this answer engine to enable all of your employees to ask questions and get direct. Yeah, you're you're letting them the focus answer. on the higher order problem totally. and taking a lot of that productized experience. So, how do you deal with the, like the go into an organization that got a bunch of unstructured data on file servers, for example, with permissions that sit over top? How do you typically engage at that level and work out? what data belongs to who and how do you integrate with their authentication mechanisms and then pass context through the answers engine yeah. kind of separate outside of their organization. So, so one of the things that, that we've tried to focus on, on here and the security piece is, is a challenge and I think, um, and what I mean by that is kind of the comparisons between a traditional search system which is we have all of our enterprise data indexed in Elastic and I'm just going to make up a, a, a vendor versus a very targeted user group for this. And so like, as an example, like um, we, you could deploy a system for customer support agents. All of those customer support agents are allowed to see that data. Um, it's very focused solely on customer support agents. It's a knowledge base for customer support agents. And so we're gonna build an answer engine for customer support, support agents that no one else has, has access to. Whereas if you're an enterprise search in, index, like I got my customer support agents hitting this, I got my hitting that, and then you're indexing basically. And so when we think about kind of these answer engine problems and um, is focusing on very targeted repositories of information that because they're targeted kind of solve for a lot of the stuff that you're I suppose actually. it probably gives you better results at the other end. 100%. Yeah. And so there's a thing that I, I like to kind of talk about uh, called knowledge soup, <laughs> where it's like, hey, when you throw too much stuff into the soup, um, 
things start to conflict with, the, with, the, with each other. And these systems don't actually understand the language. So like if I throw in HR data, IT data, um, finance data, like those people are going to use words, the exact same words, spelled the exact same way in different ways. And so how's the system know which one and who the person is? And see, so then you got to bring in a bunch of contextual information with the user as they log in, it just becomes super, super complex. So how do you envisage, I guess, the user interface? So what you're saying really is that at the moment, the current train of thought is to build effectively co-pilots. I know that's kind of thrown around a bit. Yeah. Co-pilots for individual tasks, business unit functions. If I'm a user that's got, say, access to three or four or five or ten different co-pilots, how do you envisage the user to interact with those? Yeah. So a unified um, system, separate system? Yeah, ideally a unified system. So like in the, in the sense that um, a user is accessing a, a a repository of information that is consistent to do their to do their job. Ideally, they're not going to log into five or six or seven different systems and ask those systems to ask to ask quite uh, uh, to get their answers out of those out of those systems. So, so ideally, they're living within Click or living within the application, but having Click answers plugged into their application to enable that that natural language interface. And that natural language interface is very much as you'll see in a second. It's ChatGPT like. So you ask a question. It starts streaming a response back, links to the un underlying data source, get your answer, continue to do your, do you, your job. Do you envisage using something like Teams or Slack or something like yeah, that? Yeah, there's all these different modes of, of or channels of communication that you're going to want to, to plug into potentially. Yeah. So following up on that stream of questioning, um, it, it, let's say the, the, the corpus of data is all about product and different versions of a product. Would all of the all of the different teams of people that need to access that information, so be it support or um, marketing or sales, would they all come at that same um, set of information with the language they would use for their different jobs, or would there be three different categories? Yeah, no, they'd be that'd be one one category of of information. Mm -hmm. um, now we found that at least with the semantic understanding that we're seeing from these systems today, they are broad enough to capture marketing, um, sales, um, support. Su support into a single repository of, of information. So they're not as narrow as kind of traditional systems where it's like you really need to hone in on those semantics for a specific user and good luck going just a little bit left or right of, of that. And so these systems are actually surprisingly good at understanding semantics at a, at a level that, hey, we have these people that are clustered by each other if we were to actually kind of plot them in an embedding space. Um, but it's not like someone from um, I'm just like uh, finance coming in and trying to ask some question using completely esoteric la language. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, these systems are, are, are surprisingly good. Finance, and, finance are the only people that have more acronyms than IT. Uh, DOD. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've done a lot of work with the Department of Defense, and uh, the, the acronyms can get, can get quite long. And, uh, and they're backronyms too. That means they're usually memorable words that have a oh right, right. So you have the double collision there. Yeah. Right. And so let me actually skip to this side so we can get to the, the the software demo. And so we're abstracting away a lot of this complexity for, for for users. And so we're just saying again, this is a simple plug and play system that you know you ingest your unstructured text data and you immediately start hammering it with questions. Now there's going to be some kind of knobs that you want to turn uh, along along the way so you have some flexibility in the in, in the system it's not completely um, but you do kind of narrow um, you know some of that bespoke capability when you actually build an end-to-end -end system but um, the one thing that we consist consistently hear from customers and I always use the word cobbling because I hear that consistently yeah. from, from customers is we're cobbling this together ourselves so if you have it can I please just just have it from you um, because I have three to five data scientists on this, and I'd love to get them focused on something that goes, a model that goes into our product versus a mod model that goes to our customer support agents. And so with that, I'll bring up my colleague, uh, Kyle Jordan, who's going to cover generative AI, click answers, but then also show all of the um, product updates that we're doing for click auto ML. Um, and just to, to clarify, and I'm sure everyone kind of understands this, but the types of use cases that you would go after with Click Auto ML and the models that you use there are different than what you would actually use a generative model for. Um, and so we enable 
know, both the auto ML capabilities of building those models for you know, structured numerical data predictive cases and for the, the generative stuff on the unstructured data side. So.